So in this one, I, I've sort of uh, talked about this one as, as being the uh, uh, part of the household structural pests. Now, when we talk about structural pests, uh, we will talk about termites and, and things that actually can eat the buildings uh, that, that some of you will be working in. But uh, today we're going to be talking about the, the stored products pests and another group of insects that are just sort of generally considered to be filth insects. And, and again, I always have to kind of smile about that. Some people in some cultures think that pigs are filthy. Uh, and, and the reality is, is that, yeah, if, if you force a pig to live in squalor, it will live there and, and will pick up diseases and so forth. But if you give the pig the, the right to live in a nice, clean environment, guess which one will it will pick? Will it pill the, pick the stinky, smelly, poop-filled habitat or the nice, clean one? It'll go to the clean one. How do we know that? Guess what uh, the people have for pets now? Pigs. And, and uh, again, I'm always amazed that, that uh, people think, oh my God, you've got a pig in your house? Well, in, in some cases, pigs can actually be cleaner. Uh, they, they prefer to be cleaner than sometimes the cats and the dogs. So it, it really depends on what you're doing. And so when we talk about the filth insect, we're talking about things like cockroaches and flies and things like that that... Uh, don't don't hesitate at all to let's say visit the poop in the front yard, get their legs and mouth parts contaminated, and then they fly inside the house uh, and visit your potato salad that might be sitting out uh, on the counter, and then sort of accidentally transfer those bacteria to those areas. Now the first group that we're going to do is is probably the one that, that I spend most of my time when I'm dealing with the general public. Uh, in our diagnostic clinic, and these are the stored products pests. Uh, last week alone, I had two stored products pests submitted to our diagnostic clinic that I had to, to educate people about. <clears throat> Basically, these are things that in our kitchen, we have stored products. And, and what would be the stored products that are most available to these insects in your kitchen? Would they be things in the tin cans? Would they be things in the refrigerator? No. They're basically the dried materials that you keep in the pantry, and that's why they're often called pantry pests. So whether it be your spices, uh, there's a couple of little beetles that love to get into cayenne pepper. Uh, I still remember the a few years ago when I was back at Penn State, they always had about this time of the year, they had a chili contest. Now, I won it one year. Uh, but uh, one of the years that, that I made chili for the, the contest, uh, I dumped out the chili powder, and, and my wife came back a, a few minutes later and said, Dave, uh, did you notice that there's these little round balls of chili powder floating around on the top of your chili? And I said, no, I hadn't. Uh, so I went over and looked, and I go, oh, that's interesting. So I picked out one of the little balls and set it over on the counter. I knew what was probably in there and, and poked it, and this little fat white larva fell out of it. And, and that was one of the, the uh, uh, drugstore beetle larvae that, that had been in that powder. Now, I was left with, should I just stir this up? And, and the reality is, is once the larvae are cooked, uh, they'll be brown and nobody probably really realize what that is. They'll just think it's a chunk of the hamburger or a piece of meat or something in there. But I, I did diligently scoop out what I could and stirred the rest of it. And, and everybody has served the, uh, served the chili too, thought it was really great and wonderful and so forth. So these things are, are constantly occurring in your foods. Uh, we'll also learn in, in the laboratory uh, this week, and I'll show you a little bit later on in this lecture, that there are actually food tolerances by our government. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration has a whole website on what is allowed in your food. And, and uh, to give you an example, uh, you're allowed so many ground beetle and moth parts uh, per ounce of peanut butter. And, and so sometimes when you get that, that chunky peanut butter or the, the uh, non-homogenized peanut butter that has the little brown chunks in there, some of those little brown chunks, if you look at them under the microscope, may be a beetle leg or uh, a 
bit or piece of a wing cover of a beetle or something like that. So uh, there are food tolerances that, that are uh, a lot of people are unaware of, but why do, why do we have these food tolerances? Well, it's impossible in reality to completely eliminate all critters that might be in your food and so uh, we've done testing people now I haven't done it but other people have done testing and evaluation and, and in general uh, these other insects uh, and their materials that might be in the foods basically pose no harm to you and in some cases actually can improve the flavor of the food We'll talk about that here in a minute, um, and uh, also can improve the food quality. They do uh, add some nutrients in some cases uh, to that. So what are the pantry pests? Uh, it's primarily a group of beetles. Uh, there, there's actually quite an array of beetles that can get into our stored fruits. Uh, there are people that call me all the time and say, I've got worms in my cabinet. And I, I go, well, uh, gee, uh, do you have a, a fisherman in the, in the, no, no. What they're talking about generally are caterpillars. Uh, they don't really have worms in their cabinet, but they, they see these little caterpillars. They'll call those a worm, and, and so they've got some of the pantry moths. Uh, we also have some little mites. Uh, most of the mites that we get into our foods are ones that get into very moldy foods. You wouldn't want to eat it in the first place, but I find it interesting. There is a cheese mite. Uh, and again, in Europe, uh, there are some cheeses that actually use this cheese mite uh, as an extra flavoring. It, it, uh, I'm not a real big fan of, of blue cheeses from Roquefort cheese and so forth. I'm even less of a fan of, of uh, some of the mite cheeses. They're, they're really funky kind of flavors uh, to those. But some people are, are into that stuff. <coughs> and then a case, uh, of course, we do get ants. Now, ants I would consider to be one of those filth insects. Uh, but they can get into your stored products also. Now, when we're talking about these pests, why are these pests there? If we go back to our integrated pest management, what is it that allows these pests to make a living, so to speak, inside of our stored foods? And, and the reality is uh, all pests have these needs. They need a place to live. They need water and they need food. And, and so in our cabinet, let's think about that. Uh, if you've got a cereal box in there. What does that cereal box provide them? Well, it provides them with space, the habitat, provides them with the food, but wait a minute. What water is supplied by that cereal? Have any idea? Well, if you go back to our metabolism, when we talked about metabolism, what happens when you combine oxygen with sugar? What do you get? We, we call it burning sugar in your cells, but is it really burning? No, you're metabolizing it, and you're combining the sugar with oxygen, and what are the byproducts of those? What do you exhale? Carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is produced, but interestingly is enough is that water is produced. So when you burn sugar in your cells, your cells are constantly producing water and carbon dioxide. Now you get rid of the carbon dioxide by exhaling that. And how do you get rid of the excess water that's produced? You urinate that. You get rid of that way. But in the case of, of insects, remember that insects have this exoskeleton that's uh, very conserving of water. And so we call that metabolic water. And the reality is, is that many of these stored products pests have the ability to make their own water out of digesting their carbohydrate foods. And so they don't need any water. Uh, they, they can metabolize the, the foods and make their water. And since they have an exoskeleton and, and those malpigian tubules, uh, they can conserve that water and keep all the water that they need without getting anything else uh, with that. 
Now, on the other hand, if we take a look at something like some of the cockroaches, we know that some of the cockroaches are not all that efficient in conserving water. And so there are a couple of the cockroaches uh, that, that really need access to water. So you'll find those cockroaches generally where there might be plumbing leaks or access to the storm sewers or something like that where they can get water. Oh my, uh, here's a, uh, if you go to the, the Centers for Disease Control, CDC and, and uh, USDA websites, uh, there are all kinds of websites on, on the stored products pests and this happens to be uh, one of the USDA uh, pictorial slides on, on just some of the common beetles that attack some of our stored products materials. Now, basically, if you take a look at this, you can see what looks like sort of traditional beetles. They, they have the wing covers. Uh, you can see the normal head, thorax, and, and uh, abdomen in there. But then there's another group of beetles over here that have a snout. And what do we call those uh, beetles that have a snout? Weevils. And so there are some regular beetles that get into our stored products, and there are some weevils also that get into our stored products. Now, in essence, uh, these beetles can feed in, in all different kinds of ways in, in our foods. <clears throat> they can be what I call external feeders. That means they just chew on the surface and the exterior of, of the material. Uh, and, and so those are things that you might find in the, the spices, pasta, flour, almost any of that, that kind of uh, thing that has nutrient value in it. But then there's a, a group of these that are internal feeders. And what do I mean by that? They basically, the larva has to be encased inside of the seed of something. So what are the seeds that you use that might be in your pantry? Corn, absolutely. Corn would be a whole grain. And indeed, you could get some of the these uh, a little weevils that, that would get into the corn. Anything else? No vegetarians in here? What's the biggest protein substitute for a vegetarian? Beans, absolutely, and and, and so uh, beans would uh, whole beans would be a very good uh, thing, and and there's a couple of these, uh, as you can see here, the pea and bean weevils. Uh, those those are some that, that would get in there. Uh, rices, uh, whole wheat, things like that. Uh, uh, there are some of these would get into those. Yeah. So I'm still not clear on the difference between Okay. External, uh, as far as I'm concerned, really means that the larva can feed either by just chewing on the surface of the food or feeding on the bits and pieces of the food uh, the, that, that might exist in the package or near the package, something like that. While the internal feeders are ones that need a whole grain, they would need a, a, a bean, uh, they would need a pea, they would need a whole corn. Uh, but if, if you made cracked corn, like you ha might have for bird seed or something like that, those internal feeders now couldn't live inside that. They need to be inside of, of the husk of a seed of some sort, okay? <clears throat> then we have what a, a general group that are sometimes just called scavengers, uh, and these usually occur most commonly uh, in, in the warehouse where there might be spillage of this on the floor, and so you just get sort of dust and debris of the, the uh, flour and, and food materials, things like that. Then uh, eventually if, if some of these foods get uh, moist or wet or damp, uh, they can often develop molds. And it's kind of interesting, uh, I can actually have some of these external feeders that generate, especially in a, now that we have a lot of tightly sealed plastic containers of our foods, Things like the drugstore beetles can build up uh, so much moisture in that that we begin to get molds and mildews in it. And at that time, we will then get uh, things like mealworms and spider beetles that would come in uh, to that. They, these uh, other insects apparently need a little bit more moisture uh, in, in their food in order to, to grow. And so they can rely on, on some of the other pests that make that moisture. And then once uh, the molds and mildews have started, come in and, and start feeding on that. <clears throat> By far, the most common beetles and the two samples that I got last week were both 
drugstore beetles. Uh, people had sent them in. Uh, they, they had, uh, you know, what I keep finding these little beetles uh, flying around in my windows. Uh, what were, what are they, and where do they come from? Well, uh, these are our most common uh, pantries. These are, are little tiny beetles, only about an eighth of an inch long. Uh, both of them are brown, and there's really only slight differences between them. Uh, now, where do you think the drugstore beetle was most common? In drugstores. What was in drugstores? What was in our old pharmacies? Well, if you think about it, the, the, the original old pharmacies were a lot of, of ground-up herbs and things like that. So being the, this ground-up herb uh, kept in a little container of some sort, usually a tin can or, or something like that, was ideal food for those. Now, what do you think a cigarette beetle will eat? <laughs> what does the name imply itself? Okay. And if I'm eating cigarette which is tobacco what's we've already talked about it what's in that tobacco nicotine and for those of you that may have looked up nicotine uh, nicotine is a pretty potent poison and so there's really only very few insects that can actually eat nicotine and, and actually the cigarette beetle is uh, can eat a wide variety of things but it seems to prefer uh, materials that do contain toxins in them. It, it seems to be tolerant of that. And in some cases, we've even seen cigarette beetles get into people's pills and, and medicines. They, they can actually get in there and feed on some of those materials because a lot of the, the formulated pills and medicines may have some sugars and other carbohydrates in there to, to make the pill, and, and they seem to be able to uh, tolerate uh, the, the toxic effect of the medicines that would be in there. By far, <coughs> I would say that, that uh, if I got a hundred samples of these little beetles, maybe two, three, or four of them would be cigarette beetles. All the rest of them will be drugstore beetles. So don't let the names fool you. The drugstore beetle is by far the most common one. Uh, these things can occur in dry pasta, cookies and crackers, spices now they really do like nuts uh, and and uh, I'm going to bring in some chocolates uh, tomorrow uh, to, to show you uh, one of my favorite ones is, is uh, the, uh, the little Hershey's Kisses and I, re I still remember to this day the time that, that my mom always had this little uh, glass uh, uh, jar on, on her dining room table that she would keep chocolates in. And as kids, we always remembered that when we went to visit mom and all the grandkids went to visit mom, that she could just uh, pull the lid, over, reach in there, get an M&M, &M and, and chow down on it. One time I reached in there and got it, and I go, well, that's interesting. There's a whole bunch of holes in there. And, and so I, I didn't pop it down. I opened it up and broke it apart. I and mean, there were a whole bunch of drugstore beetle larvae on the inside of that. A lot of people forget dry dog food and dry cat food. Excellent materials for these things. And, and so quite often people say, well, I can't find where this pest is, uh, where it's coming from. I've checked my pantry and everything else. And I say, well, do you have a cat? Or do you have a dog? Or... Do you feed the birds? Uh, do you have a bird feeder or something like that? Quite often the answer is, oh, yeah, I, I think I've got an old bag of that down in the basement. And when they go down and check it, open the bag up, there's this thousands of these beetles uh, inside of that uh, container. <clears throat> also remember that... Uh, it used to be a, a big thing in the, the 60s and 70s for the, the ladies to put these potpourris around the house. Now, what's a potpourri? It's a little bag or sachet that typically has uh, flower petals and seeds uh, things and things like that that do release fragrances and and so if you think about it uh, the the flower petals eventually will crumble apart into a little powder this whole seeds are there and and so those can serve as food for some of these stored products best what do they look like? Uh, well, over here is actually a, a dry dog food biscuit. Uh, you can see over here is a couple of cat food kibbles, and, and you can see that there's uh, these, these perfectly round little holes in there. 
and of course if you open the package up the beetle should be in there also now the larvae are burrow actually inside of that so the, the larvae can feed both externally and internally in here but once the larva pupates and, and the little beetle emerges they make this perfectly round uh, emergence hole as they chew out of that food <coughs> now how do I know it's a beetle Yes, it has the, it's sort of has the, it looks like it just is covered with this little hard shell, and yeah, it has those two little wing covers, the elytra on the, on the back of there. Now, the technical difference, uh, actually, when I'm just looking at these uh, visually, I, I can't tell them apart very well, other than typically the, the uh, cigarette beetle appears will be a little bit shinier than the drugstore beetle, and that's caused by the drugstore beetle has a denser pile of hairs on the back of the, the elytra. But if you get them under the microscope, there are some differences in, in the antennae, and you can definitely see differences in, in the pubescence or, or amount of hairs that are on those elytra. <coughs> Another group that we occasionally get are spider beetles. Now, why do you think we call them spider beetles? Well, if you look at them, they have the head and the prothorax greatly reduced down into what almost looks like a cephalothorax. And then they have a large round abdomen that would look almost like the, the uh, uh, cephalothorax and abdomen of a spider. Uh, and then if you also look at them, they have these really gangly long legs that uh, almost look kind of spider-like. And so that's where they get the name uh, spider beetles. Again, these are primarily uh, stored products pests and, and usually uh, where we have higher moisture content, uh, places that some of this may have gotten wet and, and uh, are moist for some, one reason or another. <clears throat> To give you an example of what these look like, here's the American spider beetle. This is really kind of an interesting one as far as I'm concerned. This one has been a stored products pest so long that it's actually lost its hind leg or hind wings. It can't fly. And the elytra actually have a little suture that joins them together. It's almost impossible to open those uh, uh, wing covers up. On the other hand, the, the little white marked uh, spider beetle, and you can see here, Here's the, the head and the pronotum being very small, and then the, the abdomen with the elytra covering it is quite large. So you could kind of get the impression of a cephalothorax and abdomen. But how do I know immediately it's not a spider? I see a pair of antennae on that. And so remember, spiders don't have antennae. <coughs> Most of the weevils that attack grains are ones that need the whole grains uh, to, to attack it. And so you can imagine that uh, uh, the rice weevil is primarily in rice, but it can get into other whole grains. The granary weevil is, just as the name implies, is a major granary pest. And so uh, the big storage facilities that grow the whole, or hold the whole grains uh, for storage until it's sent off to a flour mill to be ground up into flour or some other uh, type of product uh, is, is where these uh, commonly occur. But what we're finding is that more and more people, especially people that, that like uh, sort of a vegetarian diet, uh, try to include more and more whole grains uh, in their diet. So where it used to be in my generation, everybody ate and build stuff. The only whole grain that we ever had was usually beans or peas, uh, dried beans or peas, and, and maybe lentils on a periodic basis. But now it's very common for people to have uh, maybe even their own grinding mill at home for these whole grains. <clears throat> Again, wide range of food, uh, whole corn, whole wheat, whole barley, whole rice, uh, and of course, uh, I often get these. Uh, what's kind of interesting uh, to me about the, all of these is that uh, when you've got the drugstore beetle, the cigarette beetle, and these weevils, the adults are very highly attracted to the sun. 
And so people, when they, they send us specimens, they say, I keep finding these little brown beetles in my window. It might be in the kitchen or the living room or the bedroom, wherever the, the infestation is probably occurring. And, and they say, you know, I, I vacuum them up and, and sweep them up, and the next day there's more beetles in there. And, and uh, it's kind of interesting that they are attracted uh, to the sunlight uh, and often uh, will go to those areas. Uh, even though the, the rice weevil and granary weevil uh, prefer whole grains, we do occasionally get them in old pasta. Apparently, the, uh, some of the, the thick types of pasta especially are thick enough that the larva can actually fit inside of the pasta and, and feed on the inside of that uh, like they would a whole grain. What do these look like? Well, they look like little weevils, and as you can see here, uh, here's some, some whole grains in here. This looks like a wheat grain in here. Now they put a, a black-eyed pea in there, but there's a wheat grain in here. So you can see that this weevil is really pretty small, and why does it have to be so small? Its larva has to complete its entire development inside of that whole grain. And, and so it can't be any larger than the grain in which it developed. Now, there are slight differences between these. Uh, the, uh, it's been my experience that the rice weevil by far is the most common one that we find, but uh, the granary weevil is, is uh, pretty common uh, also, especially in things like bird seed. But uh, if you take a look at them, the granary weevils are, are generally more of a solid reddish brown color. The rice weevils almost will appear uh, really dark brown to almost black, and if you look at them very carefully, uh, there will be these four spots. There will be two little spots here and two little lighter spots on the elytra, and again, that's, uh, to me, the easiest diagnostic feature to separate the rice weevil from the granary weevils. Notice that uh, when the adult weevil emerges from the grain, it also is going to, to leave a little round hole and, and so having that little round hole when people send me whole grains is usually diagnostic even if they don't have the beetle uh, that, that we're probably dealing with these uh, granary weevils or rice weevils. Now there's another group of, of little beetles uh, that are called uh, the cowpea or chickpea uh, weevil and, and bean weevils and, and the interesting part of this one is that while they look a little bit like a weevil, they're really not weevils. They're, they're in the family of insects that we call leaf beetles. And there are other leaf beetles that feed on the seeds of different plants. And this is in that group. Uh, they're, they're somewhat wedge-shaped. If you take a look at the antennae, true weevils have a geniculate or true elbowed antennae and these don't. These have a little thread like antenna that ends in a knob and, and so they, they uh, miss that and the, the reason why they look a little bit like a weevil is the head is very small and reduced so it, it, it looks like the taper of the body goes down to a point and that looks a little bit like a snout of a weevil but it, it's really not uh, uh, at all. Now <clears throat> the difference between these is, is the cowpea weevil uh, will only feed on uh, black-eyed peas, uh, and we're coming up to that season right now. Uh, for the last three years, uh, when, when my wife and I go down to Florida to visit with our daughter in, in Naples, Florida, uh, I usually run over to the store because my wife has a tradition in her family of uh, if you want good luck in the next year uh, on New Year's Day you have to eat black-eyed peas and cornbread and, and so I'm always going to the store and for the last three years at, at the, the local grocery store uh, when I, I go over and, and I could get the black-eyed peas already in a can but I like the dried ones uh, we, we like to soak them and, and uh, put a little bit of uh, uh, pork with them and, and so forth but anyway uh, it's been possible for me when I, I reach into the back of the, the uh, where the black eyed pea bags are and pull them out, uh, I'm usually able to find at least one bag that has some black eyed pea uh, uh, with the cowpea weevils in there. And, and usually I buy that one and bring it home, but then I buy another bag of them that doesn't have the weevils in it uh, uh, so that we'll have our good luck at, on uh, New Year's Day. <clears throat> the interesting thing about the cowpea weevil is that 
it seems to be able to conserve its water and so once a bag is infested the adult weevils can lay eggs on the rest of the black eyed peas in there and so it can continue to reinfest and, and continue populations in there. Now recently we're seeing more and more dried soybeans on the market and notice that this one will also get in to dried soybeans and so for those of you that, that like to munch on soybeans you might want to check that package before you buy it to make sure there's no little critters uh, walking around in there. Now the bean weevil on the other hand uh, is one that will only live outside but what's interesting to me about this one is that the adult we uh, the adult beetles will only lay their eggs onto the the, the bean pods as they dry and, and so what happens is that during harvest uh, we, we uh, pull all these beans up uh, bring them in package them up and the problem is is that the the little bean weevil larva could be in the bean but you can't see it and it won't be visible until it emerges now the nice thing about this one is that when it does emerge it can't reinfest the dried beans the beans have to be in that drying state in the field for the larva to get into the bean once the bean is completely dried down it's too hard for the larva to get on the inside of that <coughs> now to me that means that it's going to be the the cowpea weevil that you're going to find more commonly than the bean weevil however my experience with the bean weevil uh, the the famous one that we had is uh, when we were in Pennsylvania uh, as graduate students uh, uh, we were allowed to have a graduate student garden plot uh, they, they would plow this area and we'd go and so uh, my wife and I planted some green beans uh, we harvested as many as we could during the season late in the season when I was out cleaning up the garden my daughter was with me and, and she came over with some of the old bean pods and she said daddy daddy look and she opened them up and there's these really pretty beans on the inside of this and I go huh I'll let her help me clean. I said, okay, Norian, you, you go over there and, and pick all those beans, and you can shuck them, and, and you can have those, uh, you know, it's, uh, you, you, you know, maybe in the wintertime we'll make a necklace or something out of that. You know, they're, they're really pretty and, and so forth. So uh, completely forgot about it. Oh, it was, I think, mid-January. My wife comes down to the basement and says, uh, David, apparently we've got an infestation. So what? And she said, we've got these little beetles. I keep finding these beetles in the kitchen. So I looked at it and I said, oh, bean weevils. Let's go check the beans. Nothing. Nothing at all. So for the next two months, almost every week, there were a few of these bean weevils that were in the flying around in the windowsill and, and annoying my wife. Uh, kind of annoying me too because I thought I should be able to find out where, where this is. Well it wasn't until we did spring cleaning in, in late April uh, and we told our daughter you need to pull out all of your, your drawer cabinets in your bedroom and, and we'll sort out the clothes you can no longer wear, clean out all the junk and stuff that's accumulated in there and, and so I went in the other room was working in there and all of a sudden I hear this scream from my daughter and she says, ah, come look at this and guess what it was the bag of beans that she had collected in the field last year. It was full of these weevils. They had chewed through the bag and, and had gotten out and so forth. But as soon as we found out where the source was and got rid of it, we no longer had any more bean weevils uh, in our house. Here's what they look like. Like I said, they're, they're very wedge-shaped. Uh, kind of, they, they really taper down to a very tiny head. You can see this one where it's got its head up, a little tiny head, but there's no real snout on here. More importantly, if you look at the antennae, the antennae are, look thread-like with maybe a little knob on the end of them. Uh, and, and so uh, they're definitely not weevils. Weevils would have these elbowed uh, antennae. Now you can see what the bean weevil does when it emerges, and I think this is actually a picture from, from my daughter's beans. Uh, you can see that, that they emerge and make these perfectly round holes. Now, what is this one bean telling you? Yeah, there were two emergences and two more trying to emerge. So a single bean was able to have four 
of the larvae growing in there. That was different than the weevils that we talked about, but the, the in a larger grain, like a, a bean, you can grow uh, several in there. Here's the cowpea weevil, and, and here are some cowpeas or, or some green black IP types, and, and in this one you can see that, that they can only fit about one to two larvae uh, per each one of those beans, and the problem with this one is that, as you can see up here where this uh, this adult has its head stuck down in there, uh, it could very possibly lay another egg in there and, and start another generation of the larvae in, in that package. <clears throat> There's a whole bunch of other grain and flower beetles. Many of these are, are primarily in uh, industrial settings where we have uh, uh, you know large amounts of, of mill grains and things like that uh, they're, they're being stored uh, and, and getting ready uh, to be used to, to make uh, pasta breads and any, anything like that now most of these are, are fairly easy to identify they're usually pretty small very flattened uh, usually dorsally ventrally flattened and typically these are ones in which their larvae just feed on the, the outside of the grains uh, or, or you can see here some milled oats uh, that they would feed on the outside of that or if I've got flour or something like that they, they can feed uh, just on those they don't need to be on the inside of any material <coughs> any questions on those anybody ever experienced any of these Pardon? Yeah, okay. That, that's, uh... Now the next group that we're going to have is, is the moth pantry pests. Uh, these are ones that have caterpillars that uh, generally can feed on quite a, a wide variety of, of these uh, materials. By far, uh, the most common one is the Indian meal moth. Uh, and and uh, this one is found worldwide. By the way, all of these are found worldwide. All of those beetles that we talked about are found around the world. And, and is actually one of the things that uh, the World Health Organization and, and some others are, are worried about because in many countries, they lose up to 50% of their food material to these stored products pests. And, and and so uh, it, it's very good to, to know how to identify them and how to manage them. Uh, and how do you think we're going to manage most of these? Pardon? Cleaning, yes, in, in our homes. But let's think about this. Can I use a pesticide to control these? No, I don't want pesticide in my food. So in essence, we have to use cultural control. Why would we probably not use biological control? <laughs> because I'd have even more insects. <laughs> I would have to have the, the, the predators of the parasites of, of these uh, also in that environment. So I'd have even more there. So our primary control for these will, will be cultural control. Now with that said, uh, when I get to the controls, we'll talk about this. In large mills and in large grain warehouses, they sometimes will do what we call a gas fumigation. Uh, they, they, you can release a gas and, uh, inside of this, uh, permeate it, and then, of course, when you open it up and that gas is released, uh, it doesn't contaminate the food material. Well, let's get back to, to the moth uh, pantry pests. Now, how am I going to recognize that these are moths? Remember that? Yeah, they're going to have antennae that are just straight and end in a point, not uh, a thread-like antenna that ends in a knob. That would be a butterfly. And most of these also, uh, they're, they're in the groups of moths that don't have the feathery antennae. So they would just be a thread-like antenna that ends in a point. How would I recognize their larvae? It's going to be caterpillar-like, and they're going to have that five pairs of pro legs or fewer. Now, in this case, all of these stored products best are going to have five pairs of pro legs. As I indicated to you before, the Indian meal moth is the most common one. Uh, people will say, I, I'm, I'm finding these little moths. And by the way, uh, other names for moths uh, uh, common in, in this part of the, the country is Miller. Uh, 
And so I, I still remember the time. I had never heard that growing up in Oklahoma, but I remember in, in Pennsylvania one time a lady called up and said, I've got Miller Malls in, in or I've got Millers in my kitchen. And I, I'm going, well, is that different than the, the Steins? And, the, and, and she says, no, I got Miller Malls in my kitchen. And I'm going, what the heck is that? And then I realized, oh, she's talking about these stored products, Malls, uh, that were, were in there. Now, the Indian meal moth, uh, we can see here's a mating pair of them, and they often will do this. If uh, disturbed, you open the cabinet, there might be a mating pair uh, on, on the cabinet. But very typically, uh, these are only about uh, three-eighths of an inch to a half an inch long, so they're fairly small. And the best feature on these is that you'll see that it looks like, uh, and in life, it will appear sort of a coppery, bronzy brown stripe across the back where the two wings cross and then a light colored sort of a fawn colored uh, base of the wings in there. Now, the, how do I know these are caterpillars? Well, we talked about being erusiform larva, sort of elongate caterpillar shape, pro legs, but all you have to do is take one look in that dish. How do I know there, I've got a caterpillar in there? What do caterpillars produce? silk. And so, yes. Uh, and uh, again, the average homeowner will miss this. Uh, when I've asked homeowners, what do you think uh, that, that is? They think that that might be a mold mycelium. Uh, and, and it's not. It's, it's the actual silk. These caterpillars, when they're walking around on the food, actually do leave little trails of silk around. So the, the food will often be webbed together or coated with webbing uh, and, and so forth. Now, when these caterpillars are through feeding, uh, they're like a lot of insects in that they figure out, well, if I'm through eating, I've got to transform to the next stage. So what's the next stage of this caterpillar going to be? A pupa. And what did we learn about pupae? They don't move. They can't protect themselves. So many insects that have this complete life cycle, when they're ready to pupate, will move away from where the activity is. Because the reality is if they pupate in this food, if they're forced to do there, other caterpillars will come along and go, huh, Ralph pupated here. I'm still real hungry. Ralph's full of food. And they might chew on them and, and damage them that way. So typically these pantry pest caterpillars, when they're through feeding, <coughs> will try to chew a, a hole out of the package that they're in, walk around, find a little crack or crevice in order to pupate. And more importantly, I've had uh, homeowners that said that I came in one morning, flipped on the light, and there was a worm hanging down from my cabinet. And I go, no, it's not a worm. It's a caterpillar. And it was hanging down on a strand of silk because it was trying to get out of the, the package, find a place to pupate. So again, not a worm at all, caterpillar. Now let's talk about how we manage these pests. Uh, remember the, that we said we're not going to use pesticides in here, uh, though if uh, there are pesticides that are registered, they're, they're basically gaseous pesticides that we can fumigate, uh, and usually it's for large storage, large uh, storage facilities and, and places like that. <coughs> now remember in the, the center of integrated pest management is monitoring. We need to know what pest we're dealing with, how many are there, what's been infested, and, and so forth. So we need to, to do monitoring. Uh, in many cases, that's nothing more than a visual inspection. But we do have, used to be that we only had pheromone traps for some of the, the stored products moths, but we now have some pheromone traps for some of the beetles. And, and so you can use the pheromone traps. Now, these pheromone traps have a sex pheromone for many of these pests. Now, can I use the sex pheromone to manage the pest? What's going to be attracted to that sex pheromone? Only the males. <laughs> 
And I'm here to tell you, when you have an infestation, there's usually enough males left behind to still mate with the females that, uh, that emerge to keep the population growing. And, and so even though some of the packages say that you can control the pests with these pheromone traps, no. All you can do is give an idea, are they here or not? And in some cases, how many are here? <clears throat> what I normally recommend for the average person uh, is that if you find, uh, you know, it's only a few of us entomologists are willing to go ahead and have some of those beetles in, in our chili, uh, but the, the reality is is that just toss the, the, the infested food away. Now, where are you going to toss it? <laughs> yeah, I, I would say go through the whole cabinet, everything that's infested, get it into a plastic bag, and get it into the trash can or the dumpster out of your house or out of your apartment. You don't want to keep it in there because many of these do have both as larvae and as uh, adults. They've got mandibles that they can just chew right through a plastic bag without any real problem whatsoever. In our house, uh, my wife and I like to, to buy bulk foods. It's a lot cheaper. Of course, we're children of the 60s and 70s when when we used to do all this stuff so what we will do is uh, we might buy a five pound bag of, of uh, flour or something else and what we typically do is is that we separate it out uh, we'll uh, keep a smaller uh, very tightly sealed plastic container uh, my wife now has some glass jars that she uses for this some of the the larger ones we'll put what we're going to use in that and then we put the rest of it in the freezer and we only bring it out when we need that. And, and so by putting it in, in really tightly sealed containers, we keep these things down uh, to a, a dull roar. Quite often for our spices, uh, just once a year, I'll just collect all the spices up and I'll throw them in the freezer for two or three days because I know that that will kill. Even if I can't see the larvae or the eggs that might be on the container, at least freezing them, uh, will kill them. And, and so uh, virtually all of these pests are tropical or semi-tropical species. And so they're not with a, uh, able to withstand freezing temperatures. And like I said before, uh, you can, you can uh, fumigate uh, if you've got a license to do that. Uh, it's a large facility. Now, what I tell the, the average homeowner is that uh, go through it, open up all the containers. If anything's obviously infested, go ahead and throw it away. But even if you open a container, if it was sitting next to a container that was infested, throw it in the freezer because uh, it's very hard to tell little tiny larvae and even eggs that may be attached to the outside of the package uh, just by visual sight. But if you freeze it, uh, you can uh, take care of it. Now, <clears throat> why do you think I do a lot of my freezing during the winter time? In many cases, I can actually just set things out on the back porch when we've got uh, a couple of those days. Now, it's getting harder and harder to find, but even last year, we had a, a two-day period where we got down to, I think it was minus 10. And, and so, uh, again, if you collect your, if you're watching the weather, just collect the stuff, put it outside, just hope a skunk or a raccoon that's not out uh, at, at that time uh, will pick it up. But usually, if it's that cold, they're, they're in hibernation anyway. Now, what do we mean by monitoring? As I've indicated to you before, a lot of these are attracted to the windows, especially the beetles, but even sometimes the moths uh, will be attracted to the windows. And, and so if I see them in the window, I know that these things are somewhere. And, and my probably my, my famous discussion of this was that my mother, uh, who, who used to live down in Houston, Texas, uh, I was visiting her one, one Thanksgiving, and, and she said, uh, David, uh, I want you to come in. She was in the kitchen. She said, come in here. I want to show you something. And she showed me these three little brown beetles in the windowsill. And I said, oh, you you got uh, drugstore beetles in here. And she says, well, I don't know what they are, but I keep finding them. And so I went through the entire kitchen cleaned everything out, found there was an old saltine cracker box that had them in there. So I cleaned that all out, took everything else, freezed it, so forth. Christmas time, guess what? She called me up and said, David, they're back. And I go, really? 
And so I went in uh, and, and cleaned everything up again. This time I couldn't find a package that, that was infested, but uh, she, uh, she, you know, she showed me the beetles. They were there. I couldn't, couldn't find them. Uh, and, and so at spring break, uh, when I went there, I said, Mom, are those beetles still here? And she said, yeah, I keep finding a few of them. Uh, and, and I said, uh, where are you finding them? And she says, well, now most of them are in the dining room. Uh -huh. So I went in the dining room, and guess where I found them? They were in that dish with the chocolate on the inside of there. They were in there, so I got that all cleaned out. And so it wasn't until the next Thanksgiving, uh, you know, I went back and said, Mom, are, are no beetles anymore? And she says, Oh, no, I, I keep finding a few beetles. Oh, man, where are you finding them this time? She said, well, I found some in the bedroom. What? And I said, oh, do you have any snacks in the bedroom? And there was this pause, and she says, well, you know, your dad and I used to like, we like those little snack crackers. And, and so I went in there and opened up the drawer. And in the back were, she had a couple of boxes. There were just hundreds of beetles back in there. And so uh, finally when I cleaned out the, the everything in the kitchen, in the dining room, in the bedroom where the food was, that ended the uh, cigarette beetle uh, problem. So again, make sure that you inspect all the potential food, especially if you've got uh, people that like to hide candy around the house, uh, you're, you're going to have to find out where those stashes are and see where those things are. As I indicated to you before, there are pheromone traps uh, for these, and, and while some of them say that they can control the, the, the uh, uh, you know, these pests, uh, I, I find this funny. It says, kills moths, no pesticides. Which moth is it going to kill? The male moths. Doesn't do a thing to the female moths. They're not attracted to these. Again, sanitation is our primary way to, to uh, control these pests. We've already talked about these. Uh, remove all uh, the potential foods, inspect them, discard what's uh, obviously infested, freeze uh, the, the rest of it clean and vacuum all the areas. Now here's a problem. Where did I tell you that the moths pupate? Remember the caterpillars leave the package and they'll find cracks and crevices. So even though I've inspected all of the packages and I, I go, oh, this has got some caterpillars in it. I've tossed that out. I've wiped everything down. I can't wipe all the little cracks and crevices that are in that cabinet. And so what can happen, it, it often takes about three weeks for the pupae of the, like the Indian meal moth to finish its development and to emerge again. So often what I will tell people is that, uh, especially, uh, you know, uh, wait, uh, and I usually would tell them to wait about three weeks before you put anything back into that cabinet. Make sure that all of the pupae have emerged done and make sure that they've uh, uh, covered that, that period of time. Some of the things we don't recommend, uh, you'll f still find in the drug stores and hardware stores, these so-called bug bombs. Uh, the term that we use for them in the industry is total release aerosols. It just means that it releases an aerosol of insecticide. Why don't you want to release one of these in your kitchen? That aerosol is going to go out and vaporize and, and land on your food preparation surfaces. So you don't want insecticide residue on your surfaces. You need to clean those off. More importantly, uh, we actually had a, a scientist here that did the studies on these. Uh, the vapors of these materials do not penetrate any of the boxes or packages. Uh, that's strictly a fumigant that can do that, uh, uh, that uses a gas in order to achieve that. <clears throat> While the industry will often use crack and crevice sprays, they'll clean out the cabinet and they'll spray a little uh, insecticide in the crack and crevice. The whole idea there is to catch those moths that might have pupated uh, down in there, but we re really don't uh, recommend that for most situations. Okay, uh, remember that I talked about the food tolerances? 
for the foods? Well, here is the Food and Drug Administration. And notice how they, they determine this. They, they, saw the, uh, they call this the Food Defect Level Handbook. And so to them, a defect means that it's got a, a mold, mildew, rat turd, uh, piece of hair in it, or a bug part in there. Okay? Yeah. Uh, so who is the FTAC? Is that its own entity? Or is that like the department? If you just put in, in Google FDA, and defect levels, this site will show up. Well, there are there are food and drug uh, inspectors in virtually every food producing facility. <laughs> the, they're not always there, but they, they'll typically make both announced and unannounced visits. Uh, and, and they'll go in and they'll pull samples out periodically and check them to see if the foods meet the standards. Okay. So, but it's kind of interesting to see what's available here. Uh, ground allspice. Uh, you're allowed uh, to have uh, uh, 30 or more insect fragments per 10 grams of allspice. <laughs> I love, love this one. Or you can have one. Uh, well, actually, if it's 30 or more, that's supposed to be taken off of the market. Uh, but for rodent, uh, if you had one hair per 20 grams, that would pass. But if you have one hair or more per 10 grams, that wouldn't pass the inspection for that. Here's cornmeal. Uh, an average of one or more whole insects or the equivalent. That means that uh, uh, he's got a, some, you know, is this four wing covers or is this only two wing covers? Uh, the, the, why, why would I count whether it's four wing covers or two? One wing covers one beetle, two, uh, four wing covers is, is two beetles. And, and so if I got uh, uh, the, that exceeds that, I could take that off the market. Uh, then we, we've got uh, 25 insect fragments. So, you know, if I ground up the, the beetles and I couldn't all assemble them, if I've got the fragments. And again, uh, whoa, an average of one or more rodent poops in my food. Wow. <laughs> and see what they say is the, the significance of it? just doesn't look good. <laughs> Macaroni and noodles, uh, average of 225 insect fragments, uh, and, uh, and so basically one fragment per gram in, in six or more uh, samples. Rodents, uh, hairs again, uh, in, th in this case uh, you're not supposed to have the rodent feces in your macaroni and noodles, but you can have rodent hairs uh, in there. Mushrooms. Now, the reason why I'm putting this one in here, uh, when I was back at Penn State, we actually had a big research project that went on uh, uh, the insects that affect uh, mushroom growing facilities. Most people are unaware of it, but uh, Campbell Soup is the biggest producer of mushrooms in North America, and virtually all of their mushrooms is produced in Westchester, Pennsylvania, just uh, uh, west of, of uh, Philadelphia area. <clears throat> the reason why is that that was traditionally a mushroom growing area because there were caves there. And there were a lot of horses, and, and you grow mushrooms and horse dung, uh, composted and, and mixed up and, uh, and uh, inoculated with this. But uh, one time the, the Campbell Soup people came in and they said, uh, we'd like to talk to somebody about why is it that the French canned mushrooms are preferred by the cooks over our canned mushrooms. We said, well, yeah, we have a food science uh, uh, group here, and so they can do all the, the sampling and tell you what's in that food. Uh, they can do the, the food tasting quality by uh, having people uh, survey it. They've got the tasters and so forth. So I remember there was this uh, like six month long research uh, project by the food safety people, and, and so they finally gave the report. 
and they invited the entomology over because uh, we were rearing mushrooms and, and uh, the insects that attack mushrooms and so we were kind of involved in that mushroom project and I still remember when the, the lead uh, professor in, in food science had got up uh, to the Campbell's executives and said well we've got some good news and some bad news uh, uh, and, and it, it just depends on your perspective. And, and uh, they said, well, what's the bad news? Well, the bad news is that our tasting council, the, the, this uh, group of people that, that have good palates and sensors, they said, indeed, the French canned mushrooms had more flavors and more complexity and everything else in it. And, and they, they, they said, is that the good news or the bad news? And they said, well, Here's the good news. Uh, what we found out is that your canned mushrooms had nothing in it other than mushrooms and water. Well, what was in the French mushrooms? We found a high number of insect parts, rodent feces, and rodent hairs. And we believe there's enough of those in there to impart these extra flavors that were in there. And, and so they were, well, we're not going to throw rat turds in our, our mushrooms just to compete with the French. Uh, but uh, in essence, the, that was what was going on. And why were they there? You're allowed to have that in, in those foods.